Don't ask me what I feel about myself. Ask me what I know about God. Ask me what I know about his word. I just realized something. He wasn't sleeping on a pillow. He was sleeping on purpose. Something to say I think is important but not essential would be like the inerrancy of scripture. Um, oh, wow. Okay. I hold to the inerrancy of scripture. Okay. The title of my sermon tonight is Why Church Nurseries Are Unscriptural and Wrong. And so that's why I have a baby on my hip right here. There is a level of anointing that I believe is going to invade your homes, invade your sight, invade your senses. Um, that's going to, I literally feel that chains are going to break off of you. Do you think I'm wrong? Yeah. 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 Yay! So am I a bad guy for saying you're wrong? Yeah. I am? Yeah. <laughs> that's not fair. Hey, by the way, you are a slave. If you're not a slave of Christ, you're a slave of sin. You aren't free. Choose your master. Give us some men who know the truth. Wow. So are you like you're in a real deal studio or something there, huh? Yeah, I've uh, I've had this studio since 2000 um, okay. when I got off the road from the channel surfers love war and the channel surfers and then uh, decided to put my shingle out as an engineer and producer and stuff so yep that was uh that was 2000 got off the road october of 99 played our last mm -hmm. gig and um as at least official as a band with a record out and trying to make it you know yeah yeah how long were you uh with that band well let's see love war started in 90 no 89 90 and they went uh, as that as as that uh, particular entity until early '97, and we we changed. We had d different members, and we were kind of taking a different direction. And you know, we'd done w one record for Pachyderm, and then uh, just kind of natural progression for me anyway to do more. Uh, funk and R&B and metal all mixed together because the night late 90s there was some really uh good opportunities to do that so we changed the name of the band got a different record deal toured incessantly put a couple records out and uh I was I was basically I was the old man the whole time it's like look at this band and their dad you know <laughs> uh but I was the I was the like the the guitar player and producer and came up with a lot of the melodies and stuff so Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the nineties were just a, a, a greenhouse for alternative rock, all the different oh, streams that were popping up after like Metallica and Nirvana in the late eighties and the early nineties, I guess that's when yeah, Nirvana changed everything. Um, yeah. I was just talking to a friend of mine last night. There's because I listened to different bands for like, just to keep up with where mix engineers are, you know, mm -hmm. what's, what's the benchmark, what's the a game. And we were talking about a couple of bands that we really like and how, uh, how, you know, there's always that retro movement, but we were listening to the singer and he's like, man, it just reminds me of a little of this, a little of that, da, da, da. And he was talking about some of his favorite bands from the late eighties. I was like, oh yeah, they were a great band. And then Nirvana came along, changed everything. Yeah, that's right. You know, you just couldn't, you, you could not deny the, uh, and it was great for guys that sing low. You know the whole thing in the eighties. Right. Yes. Well, who, uh, you know that's Sammy. that's rare. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just I just listened to Montrose's first record with Sammy Hager. He was eighteen on my back porch with a delicious stick. And uh, man, that's just a great hard rock record. Yeah, man. I I was raised mm -hmm. on. I guess as I was being raised, it was referred to as classic rock. So I don't want to offend you. <laughs> now I'm. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, no, yeah. now that STP is classic rock, I am officially old. Man, wow. it's all over. Yeah, it's, that's right. Forget it. Bring huh. in my wheelchair. My put. I want my pudding. <laughs> so, as a as an engineer mixing guy, do you follow Rick Beato stuff on YouTube? Rick yeah. Beato's channel. He's great, isn't he? Yeah, I like I like a lot of his stuff. I I think uh, you know he would he would be considered a late boomer like myself. He's two years younger than I am. Okay. And unlike me, he stuck with doing this as his only career the whole time. I, I've got other other pies, other streams of income and things that I do. I'm a piano technician. 
Okay. I've tuned pianos since 86. <laughs> and my, you know, my main thing is I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. And that's, that's where my focus is. But um, I still, you know, I'm still tri-vocational, trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. You know, one of these days, yeah, I'm going to yeah. be a fireman or a football player. Your uh, your focus on ministry has kept you from having a studio like Rick's. Uh, every time he makes well, a video, it's like I'm looking at the stuff that he has in the back. Yeah, like, he's, oh my word! He's got more space and more gear. However, I will I will put my released products up against anybody's without hanging my head. Amen. Good oh, job. we just didn't have the right stuff. Listen, man. Any anyone with a pair of ears and a goal, hmm. you can get there. You know. So I just, in fact, I just, uh, just recovered back in the, back in the mid two thousands, we were still backing everything up onto DVD discs, you know, for the, for your media storage, just dug something out from 07. The guy was able to open it up. I'm like, it's yours. You can have it. I'm not even going to charge you money for it. Huh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So what your band that you had uh, that you were part of there through the '90s? What what was the style there, and what how how big did you make it? What was your height of success? Well, I'm still married, so <laughs> I mean, you know, let, let's get Crazy real. Guy. All right, yeah. all right. I know what you're talking about. I'm kidding. Um, so Love War was my first band, and uh, if you look back right there, there's an old uh, CD and and cassette display case. All right. Cassette. Oh wait, wait, my my ticket plaque is in front of it. You can't even see it. Heidi put all, all the old shows we went to back in the seventies, or at least I did. I kept my ticket stuff. Anyway, so that was um, that was a three piece. We were kind of uh, progressive hard rock, and where we were going for the next record is kind of where the Channel Surfers ended up. So in just as an interruption, in 2018, we re-recorded all of those songs that we were going to do for our second record here. And that's all that stuff's on Spotify, the, the first Soak Your Brain record, and then um, our self-titled. So the Channel Surfers, basically, uh, I had a couple guys that were um, bass player and drummer. They were brothers. And uh, they were like typical Gen X guys. Uh, preacher's kids, you'd have never, never known it. They were, they were, one day they were all nerdy and, you know, J.C. Penny catalog. The next day they got sleeves tatted up and they're into Pearl Jam. No one really knows what happened there. But um, anyway, so we were still doing the Love War material. We were getting ready to go play down in Brazil at a big old festival. Um, I did some work for Guardian and, and sat in for Dave Bach on one of their Brazil shows, and so the promoter's like, oh, we want your band to come down. Well, we were completely different by that time, and uh, the drummer was like, why don't we just make make songs that people like to dance to and just like, you know, rather than trying to be heavy and metal and everything. And I was like, yeah, I, actually sounds like a good idea. I've been metal for forever, you know, hard rock, metal, through the 70s, 80s. And uh, so we just started, we, we would put jams together. We, we would just sit in this literal room, 16 by 16. There's a drum room over there, but <laughs> that wasn't here then. And um, keep a cassette player rolling, a couple condenser mics hanging from the ceiling and capture whatever came out of us, you know. And we'd like that bit, and eh, let's get rid of this here. Not so much, but let's do that. And that's how the songs developed for the Tunnel Vision record. Old riffs, we would kind of borrow and steal over here. And then all these new ideas. And the singer, I didn't even know if he could literally sing. Because the only time I saw him was in a hardcore band. And, you know, hardcore bands are more like, right. they get on their knees yes. with the 58, you know. And, uh, oh, I should have unplugged my phone. Can you pause this? Yeah, that's all right. We're going to yeah. edit. Yeah. Hang on. It's an old landline. I was going to say that almost sounded like a home phone. I haven't heard one of so those it's, in forever. It's a home phone. I got one of these, but I don't live on it. Hmm. Amen. And I'm not. I'm not gonna either. I like my desktop. I like big real estate. You know, <laughs> my wife will find something on YouTube. Oh, check this out. I said, why don't we go back and check it out on a big screen? Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> so anyway, um, 
Yeah, we were talking about the, um, where did I leave off the, uh, bu- 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 oh, jamming. Yeah. So we put all the, put all the songs together from, uh, from our ideas, put together a three song demo. I took it down to the GMA, um, you know, Nashville, big Christian music thing in 97 and got a deal right away. Huh. Singer was from Long Beach. Like I said, I didn't know if he could really sing. Um, but I know he knew how to work a crowd. And my drummer said, well, he leads worship at his church. Okay, he can sing. Hmm. So we kind of took his his idiot savant lyrics, which ended up really cool stuff, right? And he would rap all the verses. <laughs> and then the chorus would come in with melody and harmonies. And so it was it was cool. I, I played it for this younger friend of mine. He goes like like a Lincoln Park kind of vibe. No. Oh, okay. Because I'm thinking like rock, no rock, harder rock with rap. Like what no, no, what are no. Getting into here. This is funk and reggae, okay. and and metal mixed together. There's just enough of that. Okay. You remember Three Eleven? Remember Three Eleven? Oh yeah, yeah. All mixed up. Remember, remember Sublime? Yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. Remember Joe Walsh? Oh, James I love Gang. Joe Walsh. Yes. Me too. He's my he's my man. Yeah. Remember uh remember Bob Marley. Yeah, okay. So so you gotta do you gotta go way beyond what Lincoln Park was trying to do with new metal. It was not that at all. Okay. It was definitely uh a, a more of a jambalaya gumbo where everything goes into the pot. And so yeah, my friend was like, I've not heard anything quite like this. This is cool. Um, I think you need to get a deal, you know, this is, I like this. So I was gauging by my young friend. Oh, okay, great. And that's kind of where, where it, uh, huh. where it took off. In fact, I never, I, I never listened to any of the new metal stuff. I, I was just like, okay, all my roots are in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Roller rink, re- roller rink music, you know, Ohio players. All that, all that Dayton, Ohio funk music that was huge around here, and so I was, and and Joe Walsh, you know, you want to talk about the down up, down up, mm-hmm. so that's where all that came from, you know. There was there were hints of it in Love War, but Love War was definitely more on the progressive, progressive hard rock. Okay, so know. Soul Surfers was this, Channel Surfers or Channel Surfers. Okay, yeah, it was. Uh, a, a mix of genres and explicitly Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if we ever said Jesus on there, but it was definitely in the, uh, uh, in the genre of uh, Christian doctrine and theology in a poetic sense. Kind of like Same with Switch, lo- Switchfoot has tried to do. I guess. But they, uh, although I don't, I don't know what they're doing time. these days. You know, we toured with them on their first record. Oh, wow. The, when they were three piece, the one that was produced by Charlie Peacock, huh. yeah, we did we did like a um, w- uh, Western West Coast yeah. tour with those guys and another one of the bands on the label, yeah. So they were nice kids, you know, and I, I know they've kept it up, but hey man, I, what is what is going on? I got I got to sit down and talk with uh, John Cooper one of these days. I I think I I know how to get a hold of him. See, when I was I was in music. Skillet was just a youth group band. You know, we didn't really right. pay any attention to them. But man, I tell you what, give them props. They, they're flying the flag, and he stayed solid doctrinally and as a Christian mm-hmm. and as a man. Yeah. And what's really funny, there's there's a girl I follow on on Twitter, Megan Basham. Yeah, she writes yeah. she writes for um, Founders da- Ministry and uh, Daily she Wire. Also, she also does Daily Wire stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think she and Tom Askell do stuff together tom tom's a friend i love yeah, tom good guy um yeah he's one of the good guys he's been on so, the show twice and i i tell people tom is the real deal he was one of he was one of those guys that when like we talked before the interview and stuff and talked afterwards he's just the real deal i mean tom yeah. is a really really good guy i've gotten to talk to him just <clears throat> twice but I, I like him a lot well you know jump jumping to my pastoral ministry when i I was ordained in 06, a church plant, decided to come to Syracuse where I live because they needed a pastor we, rather than planning a church fresh. So I was 11 years at one church. You know, my fingerprints are everywhere. 
And then this came up, and it's the Southern Baptist Church. I wasn't, but I was a confessional 1689 Baptist. And he was one of the guys I got a hold of and talked to and said, hey, any advice? I mean, this is a little country church, a bunch of old people. And he said, man, just spend your first year preaching good sermons to him. <laughs> and uh, don't try to change much right away, but just spend that first year. And I was like, all right, that's good. I got, yeah. I got advice from everybody, but huh. I was leveraging. I knew a little bit about Southern Baptist polity. So anyway, you know, Megan Basham, uh, you know, all this stuff going on in, in Christian music, everyone's capitulating to the zeitgeist. Oh, oh, mighty alphabet soup, you know. Yeah. And, and we're like, look, we saw this coming, and I can think right off the top of my head of one, two, three, four, five guys who were in the edgy section of Christian music, not the mainstream, but rock and roll, tr true, pure, bleh. and every one of us is a pastor of a sound church. One of them is a Missouri Synod Lutheran. The rest of us are all reformed. And guess who it was that folded under pressure? It's all the nice people. Yeah. You know, the Amy Grants of the world. Let's wear the rainbow stole. You know what? I don't need friends like that. You, yeah. You've given in. You know, yeah, I um, I, I'm kind of curious if you've ever if you ever came across it for almost 10 years. Um, I did a end of year Christian music review of the new releases from the previous year, and it was one of the huh. most successful thing I ever did. Tim Challies would share it every year, which got the people to come in. Oh, that's cool. But Good I for I did you, like man, a, like a top 25 list. So, but what that required was. I had to have a, a rubric. And so I shared about that, my algorithm for how I graded each album, but I had to listen to hundreds of albums that come out under the Christian umbrella every year, like four to 500 albums. I would at least listen to one song just to get a taste. And a lot of them were immediate, no ways, but I mean, a hundred albums, I would have to listen to multiple songs. How um, did you do that? Well, uh, that's why I eventually stopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my health. I'm a pastor too, and I got kids, and it's just oh man, too much. And there's oh, so yeah. much bad music out there, but there is still some good stuff. And yeah, th the indie world has really exploded because of how accessible it is to record these days. Where um, you can create your own studio, you can get your own yep. stuff, and there are people out there who are good, uh, who are good writers and good musicians who are doing some good stuff, but they're not never going to be on radio. It's just. They're oh yeah, gonna, yeah. Never going to be touring. Well, you know what? What you know? I've said this a number of times. I've I've done a few interviews about uh, congregational singing, worship music, things of that nature. And by the way, have you heard my uh, battle hymns for weary souls on Spotify? No, but it sounds awesome. So I'm going to make it. Well, it. okay. All the all this stuff is on all this all the the Channel Surfers uh, first record, the live record, Love War. And then if you look up Tim Bushong, I got a like a hard rock Christmas record that was a lot of fun. And then this 2020 release, Battle Hymns for Weary Souls, mm. and some other one-offs. Now, right now, as we speak, I'm finishing up Battle Hymns Volume 2, and we just shot another video out in my big woods in the clearing. Dude, I've seen the rough cut. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is so cool. Because we're doing a version of uh, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, the old okay. Sacred Harp shapes, you know? Yeah. Only this is full hard rock pounding, blah, boom, boom, blah, with, but with fiddle, slide guitar, and hillbilly. Awesome. You're going to be like uh, all, all of our Anthony vibes out there in the woods with your dogs. Well, <laughs> if, if only I had his range, man. That, that kid, he can sing. But anyway, yeah, so... Um, so we were talking about worship and Christian music and all that kind of thing. A friend of mine came in and, in fact, I think he's one of those CDs behind me, um, JD3. And he's a pastor about 40 minutes from here. And he said, you know what, what demographic Christian music tries to reach? It's housewives 25 to 42. That's exactly right. That's yeah, like, the thing. Yeah, Caleb has 
at least they used to, they had this like fictional character who was their target audience that they would try to reach. I think her yeah. name started with a K. It was like Karen or Kathy or something like that. Karen, yeah. Karen. Karen would be perfect, wouldn't it? <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> uh, let me speak to the manager. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's in the minivan with the, with the kids. She's the soccer mom. And she yeah. she's really depressed about her first world problems. And they're trying to lift her up with basically worldly means uh, to be positive and encouraging to tell her how awesome she yeah. is. And that's what the yeah. music often reflects, which is, of course, uh, a, a scourge on Christian, what Christian worship should be. Yeah, yeah. Um, we try, you know, at, at Syracuse Baptist Church, where I'm the pastor, when I got there, there's like 11 people, and they're all old and vying for a position. It's like having a bunch of Barney Fife's in the police department, you know. <laughs> and I, to be honest... I, I think we're doing good if five of them were actually Christians. I kid you not. Now, here it is, six years later, we're we we can't fit everybody and this is this is God answering our prayer. Oh God, bring the people of your choice into this fellowship mm. as we do outreach and stuff. And so now we got a bunch of big families, just it's it's wonderful. I I praise God for it. Mm. Um he's done a really good Good work continues to. In fact, we may be sending our assistant pastor to Colorado to plant a church hmm. um, through through the SBC, actually. Oh, okay. And um, so, my philosophy for a long time, as far as your congregational singing is, it's the old: if you can get the men to follow, then the women will follow the men. And that's right. But if you go for the women, you're going to end up with K love. That's it. That's it. And and the men will say. <laughs> Why, why mess around with flowers and doilies when I could stay home and watch football? Right, right. This is, it's G-A-E in many ways. It's very effeminate. It's it's trying to get past that, uh, I think, God built into us uh, ways of thinking and doing. I mean, I'm not a complementarian. I'm patriarch mm -hmm. in the biblical sense. I, I don't think we can limit God's design for the sexes to the church and the family, and yet have some, you know, corporate CEO be mm. Karen, whatever. Yeah, right. I'm not saying I'm not saying there are explicit texts against it. I'm saying that this is how God has designed us. And if you're going to be the president, that means you're going to go to war. Maybe you don't mm -hmm. know. So all that to say, I know I'll get I'll get canned for that. But um, if anyone knows me or my daughters, my family, yeah. our church, you you would be like, well, wait a minute, how, how come? How come it doesn't look like all frumpy and, you know, fighting fundy, long denim skirts and stuff? Well, because, you know, we're not bound to tradition. Um, but the thing is, when when the church has been feminized as it has, and this is, again, even pagan sociologists recognize the feminization of America through the church, through even the downgrade of Calvinism in the 19th century, the sentimentality of the novels coming through uh, the Civil War and afterwards, all of that kind of played in to create the true spirituality as mom. Mm -hmm. Now, dad, dad's dad's like the father, and he's gruff and mean, and you know, and sometimes that was an accurate assessment. Let's be honest. Yeah. But but mom was the one who prays. Mom's the one who prays, and by the way, this is how this is how people get fooled in D.C. or at the state house. Well, they were uh, good Christian people. They, I mean, I've got to pray with them. Wasn't that cool? Yeah, and then they go turn around and know that you're in the back pocket and legislate like they want. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, just, it's that fake spirituality, that kind of uh, num mind-numbing pietism. I, I kind of grew up in an environment. Of course, growing up in the 60s and 70s, midstream American, you know, fundamentalist church. Yeah, it was pretty, yeah. Like what, what, what kind of fundamentalist? Well... GARBC was part of it, yeah. but any anywhere around here in northern Indiana, whether it's you know believing Church of the Brethren, uh, Christian Church, and remember this is in the seventies, so it's the car, it's the Ford years, the Carter years. We're paying for Vietnam, guns and butter, you know, hmm. and uh, you know we're we're lucky to have we're just we're just so thankful that a Christian's in the White House now, you know Jimmy Carter. Hmm. Probably one of the most inept presidents we ever had and but ran he, on that. You coined that term, right? The born-again Christian term. Right. 
Right, and and what was uh, 1976? Time Magazine, the year of the evangelical. Mm -hmm. Ooh, right. So yeah, um, going, you know, try bring it back to reality here. Um, we definitely, definitely try to approach our <clears throat> hymn singing with some with some good leather lung, sing loud, Lee, harmonize if you want. You can make stuff up. I don't care. You can sing the melody. I don't care. Some people are more like, well, you didn't play it exactly as written here. I'm like, well, you're going to have to take that up with the author in heaven someday because, <laughs> frankly, Tim don't care that much. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. If you, if you listen to some of those hymns, you, you'll hear where I put the little – just just the the chord structure gets a little different but i try to keep keep it as honest and true to the original song as possible um and that's kind of what we're doing on this new record um we got one of our uh one of the members of our church is caleb marshall and he can play all kinds of auxiliary instruments hmm. very well he's in the pocket so dulcimer comes out flute parts come out I had uh, two different styles of violin. One one girl, one our old friends, the Murgies, she's completely sight reading, but she can't just doodle. So I, I bring her in for five songs, and then this other guy couldn't read a note if it saved his life. But man, has he got the uh -huh. thing going on. Yeah. Oh, you're on nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, yeah, that's you, you know. He didn't even, he's barely sentient of the melody, but it's like, oh, this makes perfect sense. Down, 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 down. Awesome. So yeah, yeah, we got a lot of different instrumentation, and I'll take liberties where I want, but it's not like I'm adding a chorus to uh, who, whoever did that added a chorus to when I survey the wondrous cross. Mm. They they need to be taken out back and <laughs> and given a blanket party <laughs> without the blanket because you don't do that. You don't need that, man. Uh -huh. Sorry, well. that was a that was a perfect Isaac Watts. I'm I'm just breaking up thinking of the third verse, you know. Oh, see from his head, his hands, his feet. Yeah. Love, sorrow, and and blood flow mingled down. Mingled down. Did air such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose a rich? Nobody think. Nobody writes like that because people don't think like that anymore. Hmm. We're not very yeah. well read. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's extremely true. It's uh, hard to be a deep thinker when most of your thinking happens while you're scrolling TikTok. Uh, but <laughs> uh, what? So I'm not going to live on here. Good. That's great. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> like uh, it seems like visiting your place would be like visiting 1998 or something with your landline and your rejection of being addicted <laughs> to your smartphone. Well, wait till we go out to the woods. Then you'll you'll jump back into um 1898 all oh, right hey i'm all about that and if you can find where the bodies are buried manpower to you <laughs> no, i won't ask if they're human bodies but uh the um thinking about music too uh i'm just curious what music do you go back to what, what do you listen to time and time again I, i'd like to hear a couple of uh albums or artists from the world and a couple couple of christian ones just curious yeah uh that's a great question um they say that the, the the cultural artifacts that you carry with you are the ones that you embraced in your formative years, your coming of age. So, like I said, a couple couple nights ago, I I listened to the first Montrose record, top to bottom. Now I don't do that very often. I was just in one of those moods, and I'd gotten some cigars I wanted to try out, kind of the Barber Pole or Maduro and Connecticut rapper swirl up. I'm like, ah, let's let's check that out. I said I would like to hear Sammy Hager's first record. Yeah. The the seminal, the 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 vocabulary of '70s hard rock drumming is a combination of Denny Carmasi from the first Montrose record and Assorted Bonham. You put those two together, and that makes all the rest of the '70s at least rock and roll come alive. Oh, phenomenal stuff. But I'll be honest that my go-to, if I just want to relax and we're just hanging out, you know, my wife will have a, a Spotify uh, week weekly update come in, and, and usually that's going to be a combination of some newer R and B, some Al Green, mm -hmm. some funk. Um, my go-to is probably going to be combination of uh, Little Feet and Steely Dan. Mm. 
and I'm a huge fan of both of those those bands. Not really going to be in the hard rock genre. Yeah, yeah. Um, Steely I, Dan, I, so many good, so many good songs, dude. I mean, uh, Rick, it, the the bass line from Ricky Don't Lose That Number, the opening uh, riff dude. there is coming to mind. Well, you you know that's kind of a borrowed bass line from an old jazz late 50s jazz da, 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 i can't remember who it is huh. but it's do, 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 do. Yeah, but then with those little chimes oh yeah one time so th it's this is so funny milk. so huh it's mother's milk i just love it that. is it is so you know who john and dino elefante are right they they produced love war John had sung in Kansas after Steve Walsh okay, left. There it is. Yep. Fight fire with fire. That's mm. that's his song. I think I think he said something about that song, paying a couple mortgages. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I imagine. So so when when they were first working with us, they heard our demo and they they said, okay, this this band's kind of unique. Let's let's do that. And Greg, the drummer, and I were hanging around with him, and um, I think. Um, uh, the kid Charlemagne came on and we're all like, oh yeah, crank it up. Kenny. John goes, you guys like Steely Dan? I go, is there gas in the car? <laughs> yes, there's gas in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love this stuff, right? Uh -huh. It's just out there. That's that's my go-to. And I've got a, yeah. you know, back before streaming, um, I would I would make a compilation, compilation disc, Tim's Funk Collection. And it was it was around our little circle of friends. It was kind of famous. If you didn't have Tim's Funk Collection, you need to get Tim's Funk Collection because it's Tim's cool. Funk you know. Oh yeah, it was all all the bread and butter stuff from the early seventies, mid seventies. You know, even yeah, I might have had a couple disco songs on there. But oh wow, I'm surprised you admit it. I admit it. And you know, back then disco sucks. Now I'm like, oh, some of it's okay. Yeah. You know, fly robin fly. How can you not get up and dance da, 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 da. I like yeah. uh what's that? Oh what a night. Um oh, oh, late December, phenomenal. 1963. I love that song. That, that is a great night. song, night dude. Qualifies. Dude, listen to that top to bottom. Yeah. Oh, that's great. They, they figured it out with that song. I like it. The other one, Who Loves You? I know that's not disco. That's a great song. See, that's jukebox, man. That's that's 1977. I'm in high school. Hmm. That's on the jukebox. Guess what else was on the jukebox? 77. Piece hmm. of the Action by the band Sweet, which was the B-side of... I think, um, oh, ready, Steve? Uh-uh, okay. Anyway, the B-side was Piece of the Action. That's one of the coolest rock songs ever, hmm. right? Steve Vai covered it later. You know, like, I think in 80, maybe ni early 90s, covered Piece of the Action. <laughs> Go figure. You, you're teaching me things here, Tim. This is good. Well, um, you what, know. What about Have you uh, heard Little Feet Waiting for Columbus, the live record? I, I know the band Little Feet, but I'm not going to be able to think of any song. I just know the band name. Are you writing this down? I'm well. Yeah, I'm grabbing my my notepad right now. Waiting for Columbus is, is probably one of, I, I would say it's one of the top five live albums of all time, bar none, no exception. And when they get when they do uh, Dixie Chicken, it will blow your mind. All right, I can't it, it's wait. Just, it's phenomenal stuff. Sad thing is, it was kind of when the band was getting ready to break up. But who, you know, who knows that? You're just listening to this great live record, you know. So, what about a uh, Christian music side of things? What, what do you like to go back to? What, what do you appreciate in the Christian world of uh, music? Precious Death. <laughs> I assume that's metal. Oh well. With Chris Scott on the vocals. By the way, he's one of the guys I'm thinking of that uh, is a, uh, he's a reform. He's in the A uh, Association of Reformed Presbyterian Churches. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Like small group. Is that Sound. Craig Wilson's group, right? Uh, no, that's CREC. Oh, yeah, Craig. Craig. But whatever. it's, but this is, you know, it's, he's, he's a sound reformed Presbyterian. I'm a Baptist. Okay, whatever. We got 
big fish to fry anyway. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'll tend, if, if it's going to be in that genre, um, it's probably going to be you know, more like just hillbilly bluegrass stuff that's that's him book. I really, to be honest, man, hmm. when I got off the road, I didn't, I hate to say this, I didn't pay any, other than maybe Demon Hunter and some Under Oath because my kids were into that. Hmm. There was a band from South Africa with a chick singer. I can't remember who that was. They were pretty cool. Is that like uh, Evanescence or? Uh, uh, um, no, they had, they had a deal on four. Rock. They had a deal on Forefront. <laughs> like that helps. Oh, that yeah, that clears up everything really yeah, nicely, right. Tim. Yeah. Um, other than, but it wasn't. I just didn't care to be honest. Um, I'm I'm sorry. And and I'll recognize absolutely that you know I don't I don't get out enough and should have probably paid more attention. There were a couple bands on uh, on like the Tooth and Nail family, yeah. Because at the time, Tooth and Nail's done a lot of good stuff. At the time, I was I was recording so often. So starting in two thousand, I put my shingle out in the studio from. From that time until about 09, mm. I was swamped with music. So there were an awful lot of Christian hardcore bands that came down. When when these small little labels would realize, oh, we can we can send our guys there, we can trust Tim with the mix, and it's not it's not like we're spending ten grand on a record. You know, mm -hmm. we can probably get out of there for thirty five hundred bucks, and it's going to sound really good. And so. You know, I worked with a number of the the local Ana Avea. Anathalo was one of my clients. I did three of their records here. Hmm. Um, they're kind of they went national. They're not a band anymore. Um, Bestiary, Haste the Day did their demo that got them on uh, with not, Solid State. Okay, and I'm still friends with the drummer and stuff. Um, so that's that's what I had my ear to was. You know, we want we want everything to kick so hard. We want mixes so thick that you couldn't put a piece of paper in there. You know, and there's no no room for any of that slop. You know, a lot of reverb, that, huh? A lot of reverb. Well, it, unless unless they were truly modern and they wanted it dry as a bone, yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. you never know, right? Oh yeah, that. Oh my goodness, what people do with with reverb? Oh, didn't that sound great? Well, no, <laughs> it didn't sound like I'm standing in front of the drummer. If that's uh -huh. if that's what you want, um, you know. And at first, I was getting tons of Christian bands because I had been in, you know, Channel Surfers, and there was some notoriety in Christian music. And you see, you're Tim, produced by Tim Bushong. Well, in that case, he must know what he's doing. Hmm. Um, but as time went on, it 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 definitely shifted more to just whatever band is around. So you know, Fort Wayne, Rockford. Grand Rapids, South. I think the farthest away people came was like seven or eight hours to record here. Okay. And uh, I, I recorded with some really, really good bands. There's well, no question that, about uh, it. Like one of my favorite Christian, genuinely good rock from the last uh, decade or so. And it's kind of, it's sad. It's not kind of sad. It is sad because he's it, since apostatized. But um, D Dustin Kinsrew, you know that name? No, no. So he was uh, at Mars Hill, Seattle before it, it imploded with. Tristan. Ah, I and, see. And Mars Hill produced a lot of good music. Like right, right behind me, I've got an album by King's Kaleidoscope. They did some <clears throat> really cool stuff, especially on that album. Uh, but uh, this is how this is so how out of it I am. I didn't know who Cademan's call was. Oh, yeah. Until he apostatized and then <laughs> put right. in the news. Yeah. No, that's bad. Well, anyway, I'm I'm sorry. You go. No, okay. Go ahead. No. Um. And so, yeah, actually, King's Kaleidoscope is another good rock band that from the last ten years, and they haven't apostatized, as far as I know. But, um, but yeah, that, that's some good stuff. But uh, the heavier stuff, I never really got into. The stuff you're describing, like Demon Hunter and uh, those <laughs> bands, I just this is not my thing. I I like like my favorite probably secular artist is Jim Croce. So I'm much more ah, into, uh, yeah, the, singer songwriter. Yeah, more of the folksy storytelling stuff. I like csn not so much csny but uh i 
I, I enjoy that. You, so. you are an old soul, dude. You, you yeah. What are you, 37, 35? 34 in a few months. 30, 34. So you're, you are my son's age. He's, he's a year younger, but, you know. And what's interesting, I was just telling a guy, um, I'm not going to name drop, but I was just talking to a guy earlier, and I said, man, you know, I, I know I, I was born in 60. I'm supposed to be okay, Boomer, you know. But all of the guys that I'm I'm promoting and associating with, uh, guys that are coming to speak at Jesus and Politics for, you know, John Harris, John Moody, William Wolf, and uh, Joe Spurgeon, they're all your age. Yeah, they're all right around there, and they're not taking any prisoners. They're not, and see that that goes back to your you were talking about these these artists that apostatize. Okay. There, we have categories in the Bible that tell us about those people who seem to be with us in the fellowship. You're rubbing elbows. You're actually working together with them, but they end up loving the world like Demas and going off and doing their own thing. You know, they're either false brothers, so they, you know, they were false. They were, the emphasis isn't on brothers, by the way, in Galatians two. It's the false part. Yeah. Or First John two, they went out from us so that it would be demonstrated that they weren't really of us, right? All that to say, though, um, Hebrews 6 still still rings true. Those yes. who have tasted of the, the sweetness of the spirits, tasted of the heavenly gifts, for them to fall away. Now, we both know that, you know, the, the game's not over until the whistle blows and he's dead, right? Right. So whatever whatever's going on with some of these famous Christian artists that have deconstructed ex-evangelicals, whatever, I, I'm sorry, but it's on them, right? Mm -hmm. I went through the same thing only in miniature. You know, I was raised in the church. I knew the gospel. Um, I, I knew that my sin was why Jesus uh, was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Um, I was baptized at 12, and by 15, again, the excuses come out now. It was the 70s. Well, what decade doesn't have its own spirit of the age that you just want to kind of party and, you know, get with, right? Well, to be fair, though, bell bottoms. <laughs> bell bottoms, earth shoes, concert t-shirt, and a flannel shirt over it. We, we were ahead of Seattle by 15 years easily. Wow. That, that was our uniform here in, here in northern Indiana. You know, I, I was student body president of my high school and probably due partly to the fact that I'm a I was a rock guy, and it ran on the hemp ticket. I mean, that's kind of what it was, to be honest. Not your organizational merits or leadership quality? No, our, our team consisted of uh, me telling my science teacher, I really don't care. <laughs> and he said, you might as well do it, Tim. <laughs> wow. I think all those guys thought I was just going to fall off anyway. And mm -hmm. In fact, the night before our senior trip to D.C., a uh, whole bunch of us got – arrested by the the sheriff for vandalism it was just toilet paper we we weren't destructive but mm. um they basically said well we're just going to let him go because i don't think any of these losers are ever going to make it to dc again and so we <laughs> did all that to say i went through that i went through the okay i i here's the problem though i i didn't come to the point where i honestly thought that the bible wasn't god's word hmm. i could i could never go there you still had that nugget of conviction oh you want to being... nugget by, by may of 87 it was a albatross boulder around my neck i mean it was brutal tell you what say what you will about striper and the yellow and black and all the spandex and stuff hey again excuses it's the 80s okay yeah. when i was on the road in the mid 80s, our sound man, Mark Combs, had an opportunity to go mix front of house for Striper because he knew the Clare brothers in Cincinnati, they were doing the front of house. He decided to stay with our band. He thought we had a real chance and he was going to, you know, be with us. So he had the yellow and black attack. And this is, uh, this would have been April of 86. So we're, we're all, we're all into the European dark metal except tnt priest maiden that was us and we were talking to guys that 
like uh, combat records, metal blade records at the time. And he would play their stuff. And he goes, well, listen to this band. They're from Southern Cal. And they're, they're Christians, but they're really good. And, man, I would just be like, freely surrender. Mm. I have to go and go to the hotel bathroom and just, I don't want to, I don't want to give up my autonomy. How about that? Yes, you know? Yeah. Yep. The Lord it was, was, it was, it was about a year, a year later, calling. Yeah. a year later. Yep. Huh. Never, uh, never smoked grass again. It was, so, that was instant through repentance. So for anybody who was saying no good ever came from Striper, you just got corrected. <laughs> Those guys, look, you know, they went through their thing too. Right. And, and it's part of their history. In fact, when we were tracking love war and finishing, kind of finishing up our process, you know, we're finally putting all the vocals on every little solo ditty thing. Well, Michael was in the studio literally next door. It wasn't even, it was all part of the same complex, uh, working on the first tracks for his solo record, which came out in 94. And so we got to know each other a little bit. Um, you know, it's been a long time since then, but he told me enough stuff where I'm like, yeah, you, I'm so glad you guys didn't didn't keep reaching for the brass ring of worldly success because it was mm -hmm. taking them down against the law. That was all about that. Okay. Um, and he went through some real trials in his life too. I was I I wasn't following him. Um, we got to we got to meet up again in 19 at the Gear Fest in Sweetwater. And um, I said, man, I appreciate you uh, sticking to your convictions. Jesus is Lord, and we are not. Good. Keep it up, man. Keep it up. Yeah. Um, yep. Well, so you're, um, um, you're tri, tri vocational, as you said, and uh, <laughs> it seems like you're a guy who, who keeps himself busy, who likes to start new <clears throat> endeavors. Um, tell me about eschatology to. matters. What's going on with that? Oh, <laughs> Brandon Wood. It's all his fault. Um, I think what happened was uh, the summer of 21, I, I just finished. See, I knew Brandon when he was a kid. He came here to re record. He wanted to be a you know rock star. He was playing with another band who actually had some success, and he was a guitar player, and he wasn't Christian at the time. And so I knew him just barely. So summer of 21, I, I knew he had become a Christian. He's married. Uh, becoming reformed in his uh, doctrines, his, his commitment to the doctrines of grace. And um, I just finished the book of John, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do a, a series on eschatology. That'll just be great. Won't, won't that be fun? I called it Victory in Jesus. I found this cool picture, real bright colored with four horsemen riding towards you. Victory in Jesus, an optimistic eschatology. Well, he got a hold of that and started sharing. You know, he said, hey, there's this there's this pastor, he, he's local, and this isn't dispensationalism. So he ended up getting really interested in, in eschatology. And about a year after that, he decides, I'm going to have a conference. And he starts calling different people, and he asked me if I'd want to speak. And I said, yeah, sure. Well, I should have known it, was, it wasn't going to stop at a conference. He made this this whole YouTube channel now. I'm one of the contributors along with uh, Josh Howard and, and Stephen Baker and a number of other guys. And I'm, I'm glad to do it. In fact, later today, we're, we're doing a little event that I have to get ready for. But so you, you said, uh, the, you know, the reaction was, oh, it's not dispensational, probably because most eschatological things tend to be dispensational. Dispensationalists are the ones who talk about eschatology the most. Uh, or at least right. in, in recent history, yeah. Um, whereas and now, and in this this area, uh, to to my okay. south is Grace Theological Seminary, Grace right. College, that, very uh, Winona Lake. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean Alva McLean. He was one of yes. their founders, and you had to, you basically, and, and John you Wickham know, was there too. That's right, and you had to sign off on believing in the premillennial return of Christ, or they didn't consider you to be a Bible believer. Hmm. That, that was the assumption, you know? Yeah. Um, but you're, uh, you're post mill. Yes. Have, how long have you been post mill? Um, ever since I took Psalm 110 seriously. 
<laughs> that's not, that started. <laughs> that's a, okay. That's just silly. Um, I would have probably called myself an optimistic amillennial until about eight years ago, maybe. Okay. Um, and even that wasn't, it, it wasn't in my wheelhouse, to be honest. I wasn't taking it all that seriously. But my Schaefer and Van Til, yeah. Bob Inc. worldview uh, just kept hounding me on this, uh, you know, victorious reign. You know, in fact, when I was talking with, with James White, we, we were both like, when's the last time you heard somebody talk about Christ's ascension? Mm -hmm. It's not really a, a Midwest evangelical topic, you know. Yeah. And um, so the more I started looking into it, and I think I think R.C. Sproul helped me with his book, The Last Days According to Jesus. Um, uh, guys like... Uh, like Gary DeMar, I don't know what he's doing these days, but right, yeah, be careful um, how much you associate with. Well, I, I I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> and who who uh, who wrote before Jerusalem fell? Uh, Ken Gentry, no, oh. and even David Chilton, some of that writing, and you know, I I maybe not quite agree with everything that they they end up with, and I do know that you can. You can be a cage stage partial preterist too mm -hmm. and miss oh, much yeah. of what's in Matthew, right? Oh yeah. Yep, yep. yep. Um I had I had a, a buddy of mine that made the parable of the talents all about I was afraid. So everything everything was that and it's the Pharisees and they're the ones that were hmm. and he just kind of missed the point of stewardship and the other things that are in that parable. However, that said, um yeah, I, I believe that most of Matthew 24 was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Um, we don't quite grasp how radically, um, uh, ra radically up, upturning, upending that event was covenantally. Because we're, we're here we are in 2023 and we live in America, you're right? Um, yeah, so, there's always that cultural gap. Oh, yeah, gap. yeah. Uh, and, and once you can once you can see some of that, I think it's helpful, you know. Well, just uh, to make a note about Schaefer, because you dropped him. Schaefer's one of my favorites of all time. He was premillennial. That's right. Also, That's right. in his Joshua commentary, talked about a return of Israel to their land. So I thought I would yeah. just Yeah, thank you. There. Thank you for that. He's <laughs> If you ask any of my closest friends who's yeah. Tim's favorite guy, they're going to say Francis Schaefer. Oh, he's just the man. I love Dude. I mean, anything he's written. You just got to pick it up. Prophetic. Yeah. And by the way, I'm I'm one of those guys that will look at Romans 11 and say, yeah, I believe that in the future there's going to be a great, great, massive ingathering of yes. the Jewish people. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Now, as far as land, I'm on the land. I live on land. Yeah, yeah. A well, strip in Palestine. Eh. I don't know if we'll get estate. back to that today, but that would be a fun one to to go back and forth on sometime. But sure, uh, this, yeah. so this this project, eschatology matters. You've got yeah. um, different perspectives that are that are offering voices there. It seems like at least that. Um, yeah, was it the the conference last year? You had one speaker kind of from each view. It seemed like that's right. That's and, right. Um, and there's a great balance that's being displayed there, where this is a, a nature or a doctrine of, that's secondary in nature where you guys can get yeah. together in fellowship and talk about your differences without anathematizing each other, right? which is right. awesome. We're all about that. So <laughs> any, any, any deviation from, from my personal preference off with your head, you know, <laughs> you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, wow. Hey, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, you can take the boy out of the garb, but you can't take garb out of the boy. There it is. It came back. Uh, exactly. Right. So right. Um, are you involved at all with this debate between, quote unquote, debate between uh, Foskey and Wilson? I am the moderator. Okay. So yeah, you'll, by the when time that, when that out, drops, you're going to see this, released. this background with the loser football team behind me too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Cause I, you know, we're recording this in August and I'm not sure exactly when it's going to come out. So people will have already seen it or can go back and watch it, but that's going to be I, more entertainment than substance. Right. Or, or what, what's going on with that? I don't know how to, if I have anything to do with it, we, there won't be any substance at all until the end. So, okay. I, I plan on asking as many leading 
questions as I can. For example, uh, to the to the amillennialist, how why are you the way you are? I mean, so, you know, yeah, stuff right. that will engender good conversation. That's that's the idea. Yes, real substantive. But why do uh, you have to be like this? You know, it, it may actually end up being more substantive than our presidential debates that we're watching these days. So, um, yeah, don't don't even. I I I am a huge reader of political theory and history, and until one of those guys comes up and says. Okay, any powers not specifically delegated to the federal government automatically is returned to the states. I don't, they're not taking this seriously. Man, the, the law of the land is a dead letter, and God's judging, man. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. We but live in a weird time. Jesus rules, though, man. King of kings. That's right. Amen. President of presidents. Um, <laughs> potentate <laughs> potentates <laughs> no i seriously it, it's a it's a real mess um you know they're arresting the lawyers now mm -hmm. in this banana republic show trial it's silly so you think about it from from your perspective you what what church are you the pastor of uh, i'm a or, church or, uh, or i'm a pastor of a church in uh, utah actually i'm a, a bible church pastor we're non-denominational uh, IFCA associated. Uh, right. I am a member of the IFCA. So yeah, I'm. Which doesn't sure. mean you're, you're IFB either. No, no, we, uh, <laughs> we're, we're a new American standard 95 only. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's me. That's what, that's what I preach from is the 95. Yeah. That's a good one. New American standard. Well, so, you know, as you know, with the, with all this stuff, we're kind of joking around about music and singing and what you listen to and and all that. But boy, oh boy, I mean, you think about the responsibility of bringing and opening the Word of God to God's people and praying that the yeah. Spirit applies the truths to their hearts. Now they they're going to go off and still be influenced by the world and show up again next Sunday with some of that on them. And, you know, we, we always talk about the Lord's day being uh, reorientation day, you know, get your thinking straight, you know, all the, the, the waves of the ocean of the world wanting to drag you back into itself. And, and um, so the political debates seem like so much fluff, except for the fact that we're on the brink of war. Yeah. And something to uh, give. No. Something's got to get well, you know. Doug Wilson said uh, a couple of years ago that you know, for a country to even even if uh, even with abortion rights going back to the states, uh, put yourself, you know, in in Cincinnati, Ohio, and somebody across the river in Kentucky got his kid there. See that city over there, son? Yeah, Dad. That's where they murder babies, mm. but we don't here. Yeah. So how long can that go on? You know, right. you want to talk about a divide. Yeah, and it's I, so I don't... interesting. I mean, going back to, you know, 1850s and 60s when, yeah. when you know, the Civil War was brewing and then, of course, happened. Yeah. You had your line. You had the Mason-Dixon line, essentially. You got north, south, and then war. You know, t teams yeah. are, were, yeah. compared to today, those teams were more easily readily defined. And what you have today is basically urban versus rural. You, you have Ex urban. Dude, and, and you so could not be more right. I agree and, 100%. So how is this going to happen? I mean, you, I mean, you just have a bunch of battles, <laughs> I mean, throughout. And, and I also, I, I feel like, you know, I need to mention with what happened in 2020, um, the word I don't want to use to get this flagged, uh, you know, you, you had all the craziness going on in 2020 with that issue. Yeah. And no one picked yeah. up firearms. No one yeah. actually like shot people over that. And you wonder, okay, if we as a nation allowed ourselves to be pushed around that way and we didn't fight back, is there ever going to be a time when we fight back again? Yeah. Yeah. What's what what would be what would warrant that kind of response? You know? Right. Because I mean, Will, Wilson talks about the uh, civil cold cold war that we're in, or cold civil yeah. war. However, he yeah. arranges the adjectives there. But um, I, I don't know yeah. when that when that becomes hot. I, I don't know when the cold wears off. Well, one of the things that 
that encourages me. So let's let's uh, let's put a happy happy spin on this, shall we? Is you do that, have an optimistic eschatology after all? That well, that too, that too. Although nobody said it was easy to quote the Channel Surfers, you know, in the song "Masquerade." It's my, that was one of my favorite songs to play live. Oh yeah, but yeah, nobody's nobody signed up for uh, ease in you know, in Zion. Um, and that's one of the things that, of course, post-millennialists believe is that there's there will be persecution up to the time of Christ's return. It it won't be massive. It won't be societal like it is now. Now we live in, as Aaron Wren said, negative world. You know, people view Christians negatively uh, because they can't think straight. You don't know what up, down, right, left or good and evil uh, is, let alone you don't know what no is. <laughs> How do you know what you know? In the first place, it's an epistemological issue. Yes, it is. So what gives me hope, though, is that is that the, the guys that, again, it helps to watch CNN once in a while. Let's see what the enemy really thinks. You know, <laughs> these people are crazy. Go on, go on uh, you know, Rolling Stone online, read a couple articles and go, wow, mm. that's what they think. Or The Atlantic. And just don't read the Russell Moore article in The Atlantic. Yeah, right. Or whatever it was he got published in the turncoat um but the the commitment to uh strengthening what remains in your locale uh michael foster has his his conference county before country that says it all mm -hmm. we're going to be strategic about our area um we're not going to spend a whole lot of time and capital emotional energy on something out there if these idiots want to continue giving money to a warmonger, again, there's no good guy, but let's face it, uh, the, the Orange Revolution didn't happen by itself. Mm. It was helped out by a three-letter acronym uh, beginning with C. Mm. So all of these things, you know, we're, we're a wicked people. You and I are, you know, again, like Isaiah, we are men of unclean lips. We live amongst the people of unclean lips. We have to be dependent on God to cleanse us, and we need to repent from our sins readily, quickly. But then think in terms of your little local church in Utah. I'm guessing it's not in Salt Lake. Right, yeah. We're, You're not we're right down near the Mecca. We're by Provo. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you ski? I can't. I, I'm a scaredy I'm, cat when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not good either. I, I, I learned too late in life, and so I don't have that confidence that my... Uh -huh. My my son, one of my son in laws is from Sweden, and uh, let's just say, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he can ski. Yes, he does. So yeah, we keep uh, we keep we keep pressing, you know, on on our local areas, and again, strengthening what remains. So you're responsible for a body of believers. I am um, as well. Uh, we have we have elders and deacons. Um, but those are the people that we really want to uh, shore up. And frankly, our church definitely uh, resembles our locale. Um, it's, it's in the country. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely a little more homogenous ethnically than most, although it's not completely so. It's life. Um, and, and a lot of the people are self-employed. So there's entrepreneurial spirit. There's hard work. Uh, commitment to you know, equipping men to lead their families. We got the tightest two women. My wife is one. Uh, you know, teach the old, teach the younger women to, to love their husbands, be keepers of home, care for the children. And we got a lot of kids, a lot of kids. The guy who teaches our our children Sunday school is like six four, massive, bare hands, and he's taking them through Keech's catechism. So I almost feel sorry for the atheists that these kids meet when they're, you know, later in life. Almost. Teach. Uh, he, if I remember right, he put a lot of emphasis on that corporate singing. Uh, yeah. Corporate, corporate worship and singing. Yeah. Yeah. Some of, some of the, I think some of the strict regulative, regulativists mm -hmm. don't quite care for Keach on that level. I, I don't know. I think he might have allowed a kazoo in there, you know, maybe a harmonica. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he let the ladies in the front row tap their foot. Uh, so, uh, well, what a rebel. I love it. That's funny. <laughs> how, how are you doing on time? I'm cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm curious how much you think 
eschatology plays into strengthening what remains. Uh, thinking about you, you mentioned James White earlier, um, mm-hmm. and fun fact, you're the guy who did the Gen- uh, Radio Free Geneva intro or does that. I guess it's kind of an evolving. <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, we're working on a, a video version of the same. Oh, nice! That so I've got good. I've got a number of those those uh, quotes and clips with the video. Yeah, and sweet. there's there's just nothing like you know who with choice meets. I mean, yeah. Well, hey, when um, <sighs> so the intro funny for the intro for our show, we uh, this is our third iteration of it. Uh huh. We added video this last time just because it's so much better than having a static image on the screen for yeah and stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, we do homemade intros too. You'll you'll have to uh, tell me what you think. Um, oh, good. I saw I saw the one with Furtick laying on his back. That's the one. That's the one, dude. Yeah. What is wrong with him? He's a freak, man. He, he's he's a, freak. a he's embracing heretics, and he says yes. the dumbest stuff. You yes. know, I noticed that with with some young preachers. They will make these broad sweep. Oh, Jesus would never do. And you're like, I can think of at least three times where Jesus did exactly what you said he would never do. Yeah. You know, and the, what what was his quote? Uh, Jesus broke the law for love. Or, or he, yeah. he will never override. Even Jesus can't override. Yeah, override your unbelief. Your unbelief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come uh, on. That, that man. Spurgeon quote about one day instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, it'll be clowns entertaining the goats. Uh, Furtick is chief clown, right? So, yes. Yeah. Well, that but the music for that intro was made. Yeah. Uh, all the parts were were done and and mixed together by a good friend of ours, Dustin Garrett from college. He's an excellent. Oh, cool. Player. Yeah. Um, so anyway, all, all of that to say, uh, James White. Um, that's where I got got off on that eschatology, uh, post millennialism. Yeah. The, the last go few get years, him. he's yeah. become big eschatology guy, and and even like. I think just eschatology guy, because it seems as though, and this is what it was kind of implied earlier, I think, if you're historic pre-mill or a-mill, you're just not talking about eschatology that much. It's the dispensationalists and yeah. now the new yeah. post-millennialists that are talking about eschatology quite a bit, which maybe seems to be something that the Lord is doing in the church. Uh, how much does eschatology play into strengthening what remains? Yeah, I think uh, so. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, I know that the context is a little varied there in Proverbs, but it's true. Ideas have consequences. And, um, you know, if you're, really, if you're really convinced that we lose down here, and I'm quoting MacArthur. I mean, let's, let's get real. I have great respect for the man. He's, he's taken some very uh, costly and unpopular stands. But if you're convinced of that, right, and you're consistent, then I don't see much impetus for uh, seeing the kingdom of God as extending outside of the church. I mean, seriously so. Um, so it's it's a little easier even to be in the Amil camp and embrace a kind of, I know they don't like this, but the radical 2K stuff because it's not the same as Luther and Calvin's 2K. It's not, you know, God's left hand and right hand. So I want to be fair there, but at the same time, our thinking is, you know, you get a generation of young people in a local church who have heard countless times in whether it's the call to worship, the public prayer, the confession of sin, the, the preaching, the homily before the Lord's Supper, and we, we have weekly Lord's Supper with the genuine elements, by the way, just because, you know, Bible. Mm-hmm. Or even in the, the, the doxology and the benediction, they've heard these phrases over and over, uh, uh, looking forward to the day when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the seas. Um, countless times, uh, Jesus reigning at the right hand of the Father, until every last one of his enemies is defeated and the last enemy is death hallelujah so that that especially is is great if you know you've got an older congregation and someone passes away you know we're all looking forward to that reunion but yeah. between now and then the already and not yet you know got a lot of work to do so you think about those kids 
and and they've they've been raised in an atmosphere where this kind of um a biblically based optimism is just warp and woof just like somebody said well can i be a non-calvinist and come to your church and i said absolutely you can right i don't know how long you can take it <laughs> yeah. not because not because we talk about calvinism all the time but because everything is is being assumed or at least it's not filtered it's like everything's based on the fact that well god is sovereign and ordains all things whatsoever to come to pass and yet is not the author of evil and uh you just get tired of hearing it you would just be like okay i can't i can't take it anymore um we've got a couple you know remaining dispies in our church they're cool they, they love the people and we love them yeah um and they don't they don't make a big deal of, about it so it's almost like it's it's part of the air you breathe at Syracuse Baptist that Jesus is uh, the potent potentate. It's his extensive lordship and exhaustive lordship that is our concern. And it and then that all starts right here with each person. You know, you can't be proclaiming the the extensive exhaustive lordship of Christ when you're still looking at porn. Yeah. You know. Or whatever the sin is, still gossiping about your friend, still backbiting. You know, all those have to be considered because we are talking about progressive sanctification, you know, being more and more conformed in the image of Christ. But then one of the other things that I say, and, and I got this years ago from a friend of mine who eventually went to the Eastern Orthodox Church, <laughs> but not me. I, you know, I had to read all the books, of course, to humor him, but... Mm. Um, is that whatever area, whatever sphere of influence you have, and this, of course, you'll recognize this from Schaefer. Schaefer's Kuiper for dummies, and I think he was <laughs> better at it than Kuiper. Um, but whatever sphere of influence you have, you consider that as the kingdom outpost, yeah. right? You got you got your your guard towers, and you're you're progressively moving into enemy territory. But here, you know, as for me and my house. This is this is kingdom area. Christ reigns here. Obedience to His law isn't an option, and um, and any der any derivation from that, it's, it's going to be dealt with by the gospel and by, you know, the application of God's law to your to your life and stuff. So, well, well it is interesting thinking about the difference of a post millennial perspective against really all the other perspectives when it comes to having es bringing eschatology to bear on today because. Postmillennialism does not embrace the imminent return of Christ, um, and the other views, of course, have this I, this belief that Jesus could come back in my next breath. Right. And so there's an urgency there that is different than the urgency that's within postmillennialism. Not that it's without urgency, but it's a that's different a good. Kind. That's a great point, Jeremy. I think that's really good. It, it's a different kind of we got to do. We got to get on this. You know, yeah. So all the all the guys, you know, go, kind of going back to some of these these guys that are your age and and doing some really good work. Um, you know, I, I just talked to a brother this morning. Just had a a book drop on Amazon, the Boniface Option. I encourage everyone to get it. Your book? You? No, not my book. Oh, I oh. I can't write. I can barely read. No, I'm kidding. Um, I do have an idea for a book. It's it's called uh, Ten Reasons Why Women Aren't Allowed on Pirate Ships. And that's the motif for the uh, Battle of the Sexes, but it's, it, this has been in development now for ten years, you know. And, and uh, I like the way you think. That sounds entertaining. I, <laughs> I have an illustrator. <laughs> Great. That's cool. No, um, a lot of these guys are thinking, uh, you know, work and pray, pray and work, uh, dig down. I think one of the differences too is that. Um, we still think in terms of the urgency of evangelism. And I'll tell you what, I, I just have seen such good sound gospel preaching in front of abortion clinics that I, I, I never thought I'd see. It's just yeah. amazing. Um, you know, it's one thing to, you know, bother somebody with a gospel track and just walking around. Okay. But here's you've got you've got a captive audience. You have people that are ready to commit bloody murder, and you can offer them the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Christ. They're about to shed blood, and this blood's been shed. You know, it's just a what a juxtaposition. Which, by the way, 
some guys sent me some footage recently of their their uh, street evangelism. They're playing our church's version of Psalm 110, Hail to Jesus. I was just, I was, I was like, I was choking up, man, because wow. you know the, the 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 chorus, Hail to Jesus, Christ is reigning, all will bow, and all will name him, Jesus, King of Kings, and uh, that's just cool. So anyway, there is an urgency. Yeah. And all these guys would be post mill along, you know, yeah. kind of along my and, lines. And I have to say, I mean, as someone who's not post mill, um, the post millennial brothers and sisters are being very exemplary in evangelism and that urgency in evangelism and creativity in evangelism. I think in many ways, that's cool. They are today where dispensationalists were not that long ago in the missions efforts and in, uh, you know, reaching lay people even, I mean, you look at what yeah. Christ church in Moscow is doing and they are, they're reaching the lay person through creative means and yeah. apology yeah. too. Um, and so I, I really appreciate what they're doing, even though we have some pretty significant differences, uh, recognizing them as brothers and saying, Hey, uh, you guys are, are being exemplary in this. Well, that's man. That's very kind. You know, it that kind of reminds me of an old um, article from Credenda Agenda. Remember the huh. hard hard copy, <laughs> and the the uh, the article was it was written by Doug Wilson called "Our Baptist Betters," and he was talking about you know some of the goofiness that's in Baptist churches and you know fundamental circles. But but his his point of the whole the whole thing was. I like the evangelism you're trying to do better than the evangelism we're not attempting. Ah, that's and and it was that was kind of that that uh -huh. compliment. And it wasn't even a left-handed compliment. It was he's serious. He was dead serious. He's like, listen, until you take this stuff seriously out there, and you're you're willing to put your neck on the line, um, then how how can you how can you critique your brother mm -hmm. just because they, you know, put their tea kettle on a doily or something you know, or cook a casserole for a carrion you know mm -hmm. yeah, know. absolutely <laughs> you know what I, I think people know what i mean <laughs> you're doing your best to imitate the doug wilson wordsmithing there yeah. thank you uh, i i can barely attempt you know we had, uh believe it or not he was a huge fan of pg o'rourke who just passed away a couple of years ago and i'm a huge fan of pg o'rourke and when i read both those guys i'm like now nah, don't don't even try this. this this is not your wheelhouse you know yeah. it, it is so good uh yeah it's a, even even uh years ago and i'll be honest for for a long time um i i was praying that there would be some rapprochement some way to get james white and doug wilson on the same uh playing field and doing something purposeful in the right direction and God answered my prayer, and I think it was a long time coming, but good for them. And uh, but but James would would say stuff like, you know, you you read some some things from I won't say who, just some of you know people that are like that. He goes, you know, leave leave the word smithing to Doug. Yeah, that's right. Just yeah. just let him do it. He's he's got it, man. So how did you get connected with James White? What's your, the history there? Well, being a solid, old, stubborn Reformed Baptist, um, I used to I used to download his his uh, dividing line on real media, and then convert it to MP3 so I could play it on my MP3 player. Ah, okay. And uh, started listening. I, I was aware of him through the King James Only controversy, mm. and because uh, that that made the that made all kinds of circles like uh, in in your circles even that would have been a Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you better check this out because there is a cultic side of King James onlyism. Sure. Um, that was yeah. a popular book. His book on the, uh, the Forgotten Trinity is good. The book he wrote with um, a guy who ended up in the CREC, and for some reason I'm blanking on his name. Uh, uh, same sex controversy. Uh, Neil Je Jeffrey Neil. And then, um, so it was it was the uh, spring of 2015. Um, I was a little slow here in the studio, and when I would hear the theme, they 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 used to do the uh, um, uh, Steve Green, Mighty Fortress, and then the congregation would come in, and you have these clips. 
but another guy did it and was kind of nice. And I was sitting here going, man, this is, this needs a massive onslaught of, of sonic uh, soundness behind it. Of course it. you were thinking that. Maybe no one of else course I'm, that. Of you course, <laughs> of course I'm thinking that. What, what, how else do what I think? Uh -huh. You know, you're talking to a guy who just listened to Montrose. Yes, correct. So, um, and I, I had been working on my Christmas record, and every year I would do a song that started in 2010. I did A Holy Night. My son uh, got a whole bunch of guys over for my birthday party. I turned 50, and uh, I think I think we might have had 12 cigars going at the same time in my living room. And I just finished this, and I was like, hey, brought out my little MP3 player, you know, one of these. <laughs> wow, yeah. Plugged it into my stereo. I said, no, I'm not going to make you listen to a whole record because I don't have one, but I have a song. And that that told me right there, I need to do I need, I need to do more of my own stuff because hmm. I you know working for other bands, I'm making money, but you know. So if you if you listen to Oh Holy Night, it's like it's almost like an over the top, but it but it, it stays true to the original arrangement. Well, that's what I was going to say. All the counts the, the, are the same. The original arrangement's over the top. I mean, it's a classically right. difficult right. song to sing because of its arrangement. So. So all, all of that arpeggio stuff I played on guitar and then, gung, gung, crack, you know, anyway, so I was thinking they need something. And so I, I got a hold of Rich Pierce. I talked to Rich before. I actually called in the show a year before we talked about theonomy, believe it or not. That was cool. And James told me to keep my bike oiled up because I'm not going to be able to run forever. And he was right. <laughs> He's like, anyway, I said, Hey, Rich, if, if I were to, submit uh, a new version of radio free you know something heavy he goes well yes yeah, and on so i worked on it and i made it exactly the same length with within split milliseconds of the steve green version hmm. same clips same time for the interlude sent it off almost immediately i get an email back oh 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 wow we uh get he goes we're using it don't tell anyone. Problem is, we don't have another one scheduled till June. And I'm not going to let him know. I'm like, all right, mom's the word. Nice. So here comes June, and and they're getting ready for Ready for Geneva. And and all all he said was, um, James, you might want to get a deep seat in the saddle for this. And you could see on his face he'd not heard this before. And his first response, and this is an old one now, he said, well, I can tell you one thing. When I was a kid, I wouldn't have been allowed to listen to that kind of music. <laughs> uh -huh. It sounds like it's got a demon in it. Oh, well, it's no, it's it's got a it's it's got a destroying angel in it, is what it is. <laughs> Look out. So now we we got different clips now, you know, the old the old uh who so ever, you know, oh, from yeah. uh, my favorite clip in that is the one uh uh, is it Tassie that he's debating oh, man. with? Don't, oh, don't beg the question oh. that forces me to... To require you to yes. embrace... Oh. What? That is... How many degrees of separation did you just do, Steve? Every time I hear that part of the clip, I, I just... It's like, I can't believe he made that sentence in an actual formal that, debate. It's like, it's like Michael Scott. Sometimes I start, I start yes. a sentence, I don't even know where I'm going. I just... Perfect. By the way, we, we're going to bring back the... And I'm going to be the one standing on top of my hands. Now, I can't. There's no video for that, but I did a, like a little lyric thing for it. So we're, we're bringing that. We're going to bring the standing on a stump. Why not? Awesome. That would be here, fun. Get some Steven Anderson back in there, too. <laughs> walk, walk, walk. Yeah. <laughs> he starts saying sovereignty walk. You start thinking it's a Bible doctrine. Yeah. Gee, Stephen, I can't imagine. Why don't we preach a sermon on why having a nursery is unbiblical? That, yeah. that, I saw that, boy. Uh -huh. yeah, that boy, oh, classic. boy. Yeah, the, my, what, what does he say in that clip? He's like, uh, my, the title of my sermon tonight are why church nurseries are unbiblical and wrong, and that's why I have a baby in my hands right here. <laughs> Oh, the lack of I, I don't know if it's a lack of self-reflection yeah. or or just hubris I don't know I, I just couldn't imagine sitting through that without laughing out loud you gotta be kidding me it'd well, be like 
It'd be like going to Elevation Church and Stephen does one of his things. I'm like, are you people serious here? Are you taking this stuff seriously? This is stupid. Well, you know, there was a, a time a few years ago, Stephen Anderson made headlines again because he had he had fired somebody who was on his staff and he was using um, some foul language and whatever video clips were released or whatever. Yeah. And he was wearing a T-shirt at the time that said, no press is bad press. <laughs> And I've not been able to find those clips again, um, uh, but uh, he wore that shirt. And, and it makes you wonder just how much of that thinking goes into yeah. not just what he does, but I mean, even a lot of guys who market themselves as independent fundamental, um, how much of it is entertainment that is wearing the cloak of some sort of righteousness, you know, where man. they're really just trying to platform themselves. Well, we're not that we're not that far from Hammond, Indiana. Oh. I, I'm po I'm pointing to the northwest here. Okay, J Jack Hiles' home, right? Hammond, yeah, Indiana. and there there was a local guy here too, about about ten minute drive away, that had a Jack Hiles style Baptist church, and it it there's not there's there's not a good sound longevity to that theology. Hmm. Uh, because it becomes about about the pastor, yes, rather than about right. You and and all that stuff about inerrancy and the word and all that. Yeah, that's that's in the abstract. You know, you you can say all that stuff and and say you believe it, just kind of like in the SBC. Mm -hmm. Somebody's caught caught promoting you know SJW stuff. Well, I believe in inerrancy. I don't care. That's what Tom Askell calls theoretical inerrancy. Yes. So what? Yeah. Right. Put your money where your mouth is. Demonstrate, as James says, your faith by your works. Mm -hmm. Be consistent. Yeah, it's one thing to sign a document and say you agree with something. It's another thing to stand up in front of people and articulate what you believe. And right. in the midst of conflict and when you're challenged to have a backbone. Uh, and yeah, there are a lot. That's where the yeah, that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's so easy just to to check the box, especially if you're in a denomination, and say, "Yeah, I agree with it." Um, I, I, I mean, Elevation Church are they still in the SBC? Just left. Okay, that's right. That's I, I think I think I heard that correctly. They just pulled out. How on earth were they in the SBC so long? Because he deal? went he went to Southern, and you know, it's like, okay, here's here's the thing. Whether it's whether it's the PCA or the OPC, or the SBC, trying to trying to get anything taken care of in the discipline area that didn't involve the pastor sleeping with a secretary is really really difficult. Hmm. Everybody wants to massage this into allowability. You know, they're going to yeah. put the best spin on it. It's going to be like like like. Again, the feminized Christianity. What is, what is it? Women pastors of both sexes. Um, you know, they're going to try to spin it in such a way that, well, it's not that bad. I, I had guys trying to tell me that the ordination of women issue in the SBC was commensurate with um, uh, the reformed issue. You know, we allow both positions. Come on, or or who you give the Lord's supper to. It's like, guys, the the zeitgeist is feminism. You got to recognize it. It's like what Warren was just trying to do over the summer. Oh, right? that was uh, we we have ninety nine point nine 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 percent agreement. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I know the quote is attributed to Luther. I don't know if he said it, but it was like, hey, if you got the 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 most horses on the field and cavalry and infantry and cannons, but you're not shooting in the direction of the enemy, what what good is your army? Well, that's that's the, the thing, and the uh, the Mike Law Amendment passed this year. Of course, that means it has to be then ratified next year. But they're already strategizing to make uh, to redefine what friendly cooperation in the SBC is. So and it's just all these it's all these made establishment establishment men who regularly say dumb stuff. <laughs> like secular politicians, uh, Christian Gee. politicians are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Same spirit might be at work there. I are you? Um, I church, think so. Is your church still SBC? Yep. Yes, so, we are. Are you overall optimistic or pessimistic about the SBC? 
about the future? Um, I, I want to be with my, my buddy Rod Martin and say, yeah. come on. We were, we were 300 votes from swinging that thing. Hmm. And he's right. COVID gave Greer an extra year to appoint people to positions. And we just saw what happened recently where the, uh, I think the, it was the executive committee had to step down because he had said some things on his CV that weren't quite accurate. Um, we had a plagiarizer and nobody said anything other than, right. you know, I yeah, mean, that's, that's I, inexcusable, right? I, Ken, my, our, our co-host, me, me and Ken were just talking about this yesterday, how like Equal in weights? my mind, <laughs> L- Litton just kind of handled that like Biden would handle that where it's just yeah. like, you know, uh, come on, man. It's okay. Come on, man. And, come on. I asked permission. <laughs> leaned into the microphone and whispered, it's okay. And then just moved on. It's like, <laughs> that's all that happened. <laughs> like, what? I mean, how weird is that? That no one di- actually did anything of substance with that. No, no. It It's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice. It's, it's the old Reagan. Don't criticize a fellow Republican. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm telling you what, when when your wits are about you, when you when you know where the where the real argument lies, right? If you want to get to the to the root of the problem, you're going to get hit. You are not walking out of that unscathed. If you if you push your finger on the a feminization of the organization as a whole, mm. you're going to get it because that's where that's where it is. These guys will not follow through with these kind of things unless it's on the right side of history, right? That was that's been Russell Moore's modus operandi. Don't be political unless it's the left. Oh yeah, yeah, makes it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I was there in twenty one where they changed one word to um, uh, Bill Askell's uh, abolition amendment, and it gutted the whole thing. It gutted everything, right? So I've, I've seen how it operates. I've seen the gaslighting. Uh, I was thrown under the bus, at least, you know, things that I believe in, by, by the main guys in the SBC. So I'm like, I, I have no respect for that. If you, if you can't just say straight, right, and, 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 again, equal weights in the bag, God hates dishonest scales. That's right. Well, this is what these guys are doing. God hates it. You can't have one standard for these people and another standard for these over here. Mm-hmm. So until that's taken care of, you know, again, it's almost like a microcosm of what I was talking about earlier politically. Um, you know, we'll remain in friendly cooperation. We send some money to the IMB, even though it's got problems too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we don't give to the CP anymore. I mean, I don't. I don't Nobody in our church wants their tithe money. They voted unanimously. So wait, IMB International Mission Board is that right? That's right. And then that's CP right. And CP is cooperative program. Program. Okay. And if they're making it legal to stay in the SBC by giving any amount to any official in- entity, we're going to do that. Hmm. And it's like it's like Trump said: if you want me to pay more taxes, change the tax code. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So they could pull that. They could say, okay, from this time forward, we don't. We don't have that in there anymore. Um, okay, but um, you know, there's. I think there there are so many guys still in the SBC that are going. Man, we got to do something because the, there is a lot at stake. You know, seven seminaries, um, organizations that are, you know, ostensibly supposed to be doing the right thing. Yeah. Um. But you know, it. You got to stay true to your your convictions and beliefs, and um, it doesn't really affect Syracuse bad. I did talk to a brother up in Michigan who left the SBC because the Me Too and the Houston Chronicle article had such a public negative effect on their neighborhood's perception of their church. Mm. And I was like, well, okay, I, I get it. That's that's not us. We don't, we don't have anybody coming to Syracuse Baptist you know, in spite of that, they, they know, they know better, you know? Well, uh, interesting times that we live in. Oh boy. No doubt about it. Uh, Isn't that the Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if it's not, it should be because it feels like that, but yeah. uh, Yeah. 
So, well, yeah. anything else you got going on that's, uh, that's worth noting here? We talked about eschatology matters, talked about some of your music stuff, anything you want to point people yeah. to before we close out? Yeah. October, October 21st, we are hosting our fourth annual Jesus and politics conference. Now everybody's put off by that, but it's, it should be called Jesus and culture, but Hey, <laughs> get the juices flowing, you know, so it's a little scandalous. And, uh, so for the fourth year, Joe Spurgeon will be speaking. He's the pastor of um, of Sovereign King Church in uh, Southern Indiana. Yeah, I hope I get that right. I always say this church name wrong. Uh, John Harris for the third year from Conversations That Matter. Mm -hmm. John Moody, uh, who is a friend of mine, also speaking at Michael Foster's conference, and myself. And we're this year we're having it at a campground because we just couldn't hosted anymore in our church so it's a quaker haven camp syracuse indiana that's october 21st on saturday 15 dollars a head oh, with okay. a free lunch with a lunch now that's great 25 a couple and if you got a bunch of kids take advantage of us 40 dollars a family very good um and uh we would love to i know there are some people coming from missouri uh kansas even california this year the, so, uh, 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 Moody, John Moody, is he a descendant of DL? I got to ask. I don't think so. But here's, here's the funny thing. Um, all of our speakers are graduates of Southern Baptist seminaries. <laughs> Three from Southern William Wolf. I mean, you've heard of him. Yeah. He, he worked on the uh, Trump administration. Sharp, so he, sharp. He's, yeah. he's easy to get uh, confused with Stephen Wolf. Stephen, yeah. Because yeah, they're both like uh, post-mill Christian nationalist type guys right now. Um, Stephen, is Stephen the one right. who wrote the book, the Christian yeah. nationalism book? Okay. Yeah, so and, and Stephen's. Trump administration. Okay. Yeah, Stephen's more of a, a Thomist, and I don't, I don't think he's reformed as such. Anyway, I could be wrong. I don't want to go out there, but. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to have William speaking this year. He was actually John Harris recommended. And um, so, yeah, all these guys, three of them graduated from Southern, one from Southeastern. And um, so I'm, I'm just I'm just thrilled. And it's my great privilege to be you know, associated with these guys. And again, they get they give me hope for the spirit or for the future, you know. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, what what they're what they're on about, what they're trying to do is is really strengthen what remains and be able to say hey those are unequal weights mm -hmm. you got to stop that now i asked about moody uh but i i'm pretty sure spurgeon joseph spurgeon is a descendant of charles spurgeon right yeah there's a he'd be like a great 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 uncle of some sort oh, yeah okay but he yeah. but he fell in the line where he got the last name which you yeah, know, if you hey. know the last name is not as cool of a story. So. That's right. That's right. Will there be uh, streaming options for the conference on the October twenty first? You know, we we haven't done that before. What we would do is just record everything and have it on YouTube. That's you know, it, all of that stuff is on our church uh, YouTube channel, Syracuse Baptist Church. Um, we have different. It, it would be under playlist conference, all that's the speakers, true. and. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if the uh, if the conference center has good internet. I've got great internet here in the boondocks. Hmm. I'm like a hundred, hundred up, a hundred down. So fiber? we never have any glitches anymore. It's great. You got fiber internet? Is that what what's going yeah. on out there? Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's what we have here. Uh, the local electric company figured out. Hey, we can we can corner the market. Nice. And they did. Yeah. And isn't it such a game changer when you get that for the first time and like, <sighs> oh, the internet can can go that fast? I had no idea. Uploading videos has yeah. been. Yeah. I'm like I used to I used to put it on a USB stick, go down to the church, use mm -hmm. its ten. Oh, I think I think it was 1.8 megabytes <laughs> upload. So that's you know that's almost two hours of upload time. Uh -huh. I would just go use their internet because I'm a mile from the church house, so it's pretty quick. Uh -huh. So, or overnight, you know, now it's, I'm, I'm waiting on YouTube to check for issues longer than it takes to upload. It's great. More Thank evidence you. that the world is getting better. That's post millennialism. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, Hey, um, thanks so much for talking with me today. It's been fun. Well, man, what a, what a fun time. And, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go to your youtube channel and check out a bunch of your stuff i, I wasn't as familiar i was kind of looking at it uh, a couple days ago and 
So and and blessings on your on your ministry and the church and uh, what are you what are you preaching through right now? Yeah, if I may ask, that. we're uh, we're going through Second Corinthians. So we did um, a little over seventy sermons in First Corinthians, and then Second Corinthians will probably end up being about fifty sermons. And we're starting chapter ten this Sunday. Take every thought captive. It's just oh yeah yeah the 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 realm of demonic ideas. We yes. we look. I'm uh, I'm up to uh, sermon sixty nine in Romans, and I'm up to uh, Romans twelve. It'll be it'll be uh, twelve nine through sixteen. Okay, but but I I had an entire sermon on uh, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Yeah, so and much last to say sun- about that right. And now. last Sunday was one verse as well, verse ten. So. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. I, I I told Kevin, our, our other pastor, I'm like, man, we are never. If I, if I'm doing one verse a week, he was like, don't worry about it. It's cool. <laughs> well, yeah. blessings on you, Jeremy. Yeah, I appreciate Wonderful. that.